Greg, you're the next chapter in GRDC in conversations. I think for, for your background, um, what we're doing is we know GRDC do so much work in and around research, development and extension. And what we're here to do is understand who are some of the humans involved in Australia's grain sector. And um, we're out here, probably not too many better spots than where we are this morning. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity and, and welcome to Brooksdale. So as you say, down on the Namoi River, just upstream from Walgut. Yeah. So a uh, good little part of the world. So not, the listeners won't be enjoying this like we are. Can you paint a bit of a picture of, of where we're sitting and, and where we are this morning? So, yeah. So obviously Walgut, so Northwest Plains in New South Wales, you know, 270 kilometres north of Dubbo, 200 odd kilometres west, southwest of Moree. You know, that's sort of part of the state. Where we're sitting at the moment is on the Namoi River. So this, so the Namoi River runs into the Barwon River at Walgut. So this is the bottom end of the Namoi system. Um, we're sitting in a lovely area of river and corridor that um, hasn't been interrupted too much over its history, I suppose, in terms of uh, European influence. Yeah, so you're looking at a pretty significant area of, of old growth, I suppose, Coolabar and River Edgum. Um, river and corridor, which is a lovely part of the landscape. And hopefully our listeners can pick up the birds and insects and other animals that are in the background. Tell me more about this little area here. So, so you mentioned it's a, a bit of a, a corridor. Um, how are you guys managing that? And I guess, what are the benefits to you guys? So, yeah. So, you know, there's a real contrast on this farm. Here we are sitting down in this lovely river and corridor, but if we just go 500 metres that way, we get up onto the level floodplain and, you know, and, and largely that landscape is developed for agriculture. So on this particular farm, that's developed for a dryland farming operation. Uh, other parts of the, of the region, it's still under a grazing use, but nonetheless, it's used for an agricultural outcome. Whereas this particular area we're sitting in here really hasn't seen an agricultural land use for a significant period of time, possibly the best part of, I would say, 50 years. I think the block that I now farm here, Brooksdale, it was farmed in 1970 or 1971, so 51 or two years or whatever that is. Uh, and I would think since the level floodplain country was farmed, this particular part of the river and corridor hasn't been subject to really any agricultural use. So, you know, grazing. And that's probably what makes it special uh, or so special. What do we do here? We, we value the importance of this river and corridor. Uh, and appreciate it for what it is and the conservation outcomes that it can provide. Uh, and, and I suppose I, I say that with a smile on my face from the point of view that I know how, I know how much I enjoy when I get out of this river and corridor. It's a great place to come and take time out and listen to the birds whistle and so forth. Uh, but I know how productive our landscape is just, just up on the floodplain in terms of a dryland farming operation also. And so can I ask, like knowing how productive it is just 500 metres away, why wouldn't you guys farm this area with the potential value that could come from it? Yeah, well, I, I suppose you can look around and go, well, it's not really farming country, as in, you know, we drop, we dropped into the, into the true river and corridor. So it's no longer a flat level floodplain. It's obviously, obviously a floodplain, but it's got secondary channels and warren bulls and, and, uh, and so forth. And, and I suppose when we actually bought this place, there was an area of country just to the upstream from us here that was farmed that we've fenced off and no longer farm it because we looked at it and thought it was undulating, runs water more easily, which means that you don't capture it in the soil to grow a crop on and those sorts of things. And we thought the best use for that is to let it go back to some form of either grazing and or natural vegetation state. And that's what we've done. Um, Probably from the for the benefit of the listeners, the area that's undeveloped on this land holding, we have an agreement with New South Wales State Government under the Bi uh, De Biodiversity Conservation Trust, so the BCT. Uh, that's been in operation now for about five years, I think. So we recognise the importance of it, and we got them involved to to capture value, I suppose, in in try and capture some value uh, in that importance. So something I guess I'm I'm curious about is that. As you said, 500 metres away, it's productive farming country. You guys are, I'll say, going pretty hard at it up there. You're involved in agronomy, so there are various things that you guys are applying there. How do you make sure that doesn't impact and affect 
the ecosystem you're growing here? Yeah, I think um, so. Our floodplain country that been largely developed from for from a dry land cropping or or an agricultural use, um, but dry land cropping, irrigated agriculture in some parts of the floodplain or a grazing outcome. I suppose it's just recognising the importance of the corridors in the landscape, corridors like the one we're sitting in, and going, well, they're really important parts of this landscape. Uh, anyone who flies over the Northwest Plains in an aircraft will quickly realise that the water lines and the ridge lines across the landscape are few and far between, and so they become pretty significant connective areas. Whereas the floodplains more generally, you know, in our environment, probably had a very different contribution to the overall system in that the floodplain, when it's dry, doesn't really have any natural watering points on it at all. Uh, and and all the, you know, in uh, pre-European times, in those dry periods, it was only really the water courses such as the Namoi River that would have had water in them. There'd be no other watering points across the landscape. And so the floodplain generally sees the extremes of this environment. So in times of flooding, yes, it's underwater. And then in times of drought, there's no watering points on it. And so the vegetation systems and, and now subsequently with the arrival of Europeans, the agricultural systems or the mechanised agricultural systems that are now laid out across that landscape are more, um, you know, reflect that variability in the environment. Let's turn it back to a, a younger Greg. Greg, before you were um, out here in Walgut and, and you grew up in... Or, Born in Canberra, grew up on the northeast slopes of New South Wales. What was it about agriculture as a young fellow that you fell in love with? Yeah, well, that's a really good question because I don't know, you know, I, I didn't come to Walgut. Well, as you say, I grew up on the New England, western New England, between Tamworth and Armidale. Went to university in Armidale and came to Walgut really by default, as it happened. Uh, you know, arrived out here on a motorbike in 1988, November 1988, with a bag on the back of it. We could say so, chasing love. Well, yeah, absolutely. So my girlfriend at the time, who is now my wife, she had taken a teaching role out here in town. Uh, and so I said, well, when I finish uni, we'll come out to Walgut and see what happens from there. So that was the introduction to Walgut for me. And so my association with agriculture, other than... I'd grown up largely on a farm, or certainly the second half of my childhood, you know, from sort of eight to 10 years old through to coming to Walgut at the age of, say, 21 or something, 21 or 22, uh, I'd been involved in agriculture. But I'd, it's funny, I'd never really thought that I would settle on a career in agriculture. I mean, I did a degree at University of New England in in natural resource management. I was very interested in managing natural resources, not necessarily, you know, conservation per se, but how do we manage our natural resources? That was probably the bit that interested me. And so career paths in, say, forestry or soil conservation or so forth were probably somewhere where I thought I might have landed. But that's not what the opportunities presented when I came to Walgut. Soon enough, upon arriving at Walgut, you know, there was a job advertised as a technical officer with the Department of Ag, working on a grains, well, it was a wheat fund, uh, a wheat industry funded program in those days. This is prior to GRDC. Looking at um, tropical grass establishment on old degraded cropland. So that's where I started uh, as a technical officer. And then, you know, a year or so into that role, uh, the opportunity to step into the district agronomist role. So with the New South Wales Department of Agriculture, the opportunity came to step into that role, uh, and I made application to that and was successful. So at that point, I was now a district agronomist with technically no agronomy training, uh, but clearly an interest in landscapes and and wild at that stage. For um, my partner and I, yeah, we were enjoying it, and there was no reason to up stumps and leave, pull up stumps and leave. So when I took the job as a district agronomist, I then I said to the Department of Agriculture at the time, as part of that um, acceptance, I said, "Rightio, but how about I go back? You fund me through some sort of formal qualification in agronomy or ag science, which is what what I then did. So they funded it, and I went through Wagga and did a graduate diploma in ag science externally over the years. I think it was ninety two and ninety three, 
And that was really good. That was a tremendous experience because I was actually working in the field at that stage with the Department of Ag and then had the opportunity to, to go away twice yearly to Wagga uh, for prac or residential schools or whatever. Uh, and just a bit more maturity and a bit more, um, you know, it was just a bit more applied in terms of the learning. So when I came out of that, yeah, I had a pretty good, I thought I had a pretty good handle on how agronomy fits, you know, that, that whole world of agronomy, how that fits in the agricultural landscape. And I really look at agronomy as such as, you know, a lot of people say to me, well, what's an agronomist do? And I often say, well, we're the ones that take the science through to the application of that at a farm level. We're the ones in the middle there trying to make all that work and how, how you make, to get the mechanism of, of that working. You know, I, I actually, I think I said this to someone the other day, I often joke about the role of agronomy, you know, that transition from science through to application. And we have this a simple saying that the science measures with a micrometer. So the science is very accurate. Measure with a micrometer. The agronomists like me are typically marking with a pencil, but the execution of that at the farm level is akin to cutting with an axe. You know, so you've got this transition of being very precise, measuring with a micrometer, marking with a pencil in the middle, which is my role, to the farmer taking up that advice and trying to execute it at a farm level or a paddock level, akin to a cutting with an axe. And that's, I think that's a really good analogy of the flow of technology and information from the laboratory through to a, a paddock decision that gets executed. Can I ask on that? So, and, and I really do like that analogy. So. Given that, like, what have you learned about marrying up, I guess, the ideals that sit within science and research, but then the practical realities of what actually needs to happen to deliver and execute on growing on farm? Well, I suppose, so back in the Department of Ag days, right back at the beginning of my career, I was fortunate enough, you know, this is again pre-GRDC, uh, and you know, we used to run our trial work as part of the district agronomist role. We used to run our own trial programs. We had tra tractors and techos and trucks and all the gear and harvesters. We had all the gear to do that sort of stuff at a small plot level. And so there was a burning desire from within to try and make things more productive. And, and we'll talk a little bit in, in a minute or two about why there was that need, um, but but from within there was this burning desire, but ultimately out there in grower land, so landholder, you know, the, 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 the landholders, they're trying to run businesses and survive. Uh, they had this burning desire to be better at what they were doing. And perhaps if I just focus a little bit about on that. So when I came to Wogan in the late 80s, I think it was 89, the wool industry collapsed. Mm-hmm. You know, the reserve price scheme. So Walgett in those days was the king of wool. I think we were the largest wool production local government area in Australia. That was taken away overnight with the removal of the floor price scheme in the, in the, or the reserve price scheme in the wool industry. And so it took a little bit of time. It took a year or two for growers to work out wool growers, which was their main plank of their production system, to sort of look around and go, this doesn't work anymore. We, our business has just been largely, you know, a main plank of our business has just been removed. Now, farming, so that was, say, the late 80s, early 90s. Farming had clearly been going on here for 20 to 30 years prior to that, since the 1960s. The 1965 drought was really coming out of the 1965 drought, was really the foray of dryland farming in the Wilga district. But the, lim the area was only limited, and, and many big landholders that were largely graziers had shareholders on, uh, share farmers on doing their farming operation for them. So they just were having a little dabble over there on a thousand acres or five thousand acres over on the side. A lot of those grazier based landholders didn't really understand the farming that was going on on their farm. They just took a bit of the profit when there was a good season and thought, oh, well, thank goodness we've got that. But with the demise of the wool industry, really what happened was a lot of those landholders became a lot more aware that their business relied on having another enterprise. That enterprise was dryland farming. A couple of other things were going on at that time. So 1991 or two or somewhere in there, we had, to, we had poor Curtin's recession that we had to have. So interest rates got to 17%, I think. 
you know, this is before my time in um, owning any land or buying any land. But I did participate in some of that with a housing loan. You know, I remember having a housing loan in town here. We'd bought our bought a house and we we're paying 17% interest. So we had that issue going on also. And so in about 92 or 93, we were really coming down to a bit of a pinch point. There was a lot of businesses in this district, farming businesses, doing it really hard. High interest rates, no income potential because the wool industry was taken away from them or had collapsed. Um, and we really needed, needed to find that other enterprise and we needed to execute that enterprise profitably. Otherwise, we we're going to fail and, and, and go broke. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And so the next transformation that happened out of that was in early 95, well, actually across 94, a group of landholders, a group of largely graziers that had become farmers or were attempting to become dryland farmers, approached me and said, Greg, would you be interested in coming and working for us as an agronomist because we really need to get our head around this enterprise and we need to bring the best that science and technology has to offer, we need to bring that to our paddocks. So that venture, which was under the guise of Walgett Sustainable Ag Group, was effectively 16 landholders employing an agronomist, which was myself, Greg Rummery. Uh, so we embarked on that on the 1st of January 95, and away we went. And, you know, we still joke about it with some of those landholders. We didn't really have any idea what we were doing. We just knew that we had to do something different, otherwise we are going to go broke. I think it was as simple as that. Can I, I, yeah. I want to jump in and ask on that because like, well, I was only born in 92, but so I'm giving away my age here, Greg, but so, so that pinch point and actually that, that need, and, and lots of people talk about the resilience of rural communities and, and the mindset of people to, I guess, overcome adversity, but there it was literally all or nothing. Like was the, flicking back to those, those early nineties, were people acting with desperation and what were some of, I guess, the different characteristics and what would have been some of the things that we would have seen had we have observed it now? Well, definitely um, people acting with desperation because they didn't know what else to do. You know, while we got up to that point in time, it really just been obviously grazing and farming was a case of, oh, well, we'll keep it pretty cheap and we'll farm it and we'll plant a seed every year and hope like hell something happens <laughs> and we can pay a few bills. But the older country at that stage, so the country that had been farmed, say, 20 or 25 years, you know, it wasn't as it wasn't as fertile as perhaps it was when it was first farmed. And at that point in time, we were then looking at all this largely undeveloped country, which was grazing country, uh, looking at the potential of that going, well, we need to farm some more of this because we need to be able to bounce. Our businesses need to be able to bounce in response to seasons. And so obviously there was a period there from the early 90s through to the mid-2000s really where this, de this district as a whole was largely transformed from a grazing base to a farming base. You know, we went from, say, 150 or 70,000 hectares of farmland, of arable farmland, to probably, you know, I don't know what the area is now, but say 750,000 hectares and possibly more, something along those lines. Uh, and, and in amongst all that, we then bought the technology to make that whole dryland farming system you know, we, we learned to understand them, the system much better and what the drivers were. And as a result of that, the systems become much more productive. Notwithstanding that we are, we farm in an incredibly variable environment. I often look at Walgett as the pinnacle of variability. People say it's marginal, and I get really angry with the term marginal. We are not marginal in a farming area. We are variable. When it's good out here, we're as good as anywhere else in the world certainly anywhere else in Australia when it comes to, a, you know, if you're comparing apples with apples on a dryland farming uh, scene. Uh, but obviously the downside is that when it gets dry out here and things are desperate, it doesn't get any more desperate than at Walgett. So, so the challenge is how do we run a farming business that can account for those variables? And I think we've become pretty good at doing that. That doesn't mean that we still don't have pinch points in dry periods, but we've become a lot better at the way we come out of dry periods and our ability to bounce back into business. And that's what defines Walgut and the Northwest Plains generally. And I think that will really defines resi resilience too, doesn't it? I'll, I'll be careful of my words, variable farming. I would also say of the people I know and, and my 
assumptions I make of people farming in and around the Walgood area is they're incredibly deliberate in and, and disciplined in their decision making. Can you can you run us through, you know, I guess maybe the different mindsets or ways people farm depending on whether it's a, a dry year or a yeah, a, a wet year? Well, a couple of things I suppose we've learned over the journey is we've learned the value of soil water. So we're blessed with a, a grey vertis, grey and brown vertisols on the floodplains. Um, and I say floodplains, but not all of that floods. You know, the brown vertisols typically are not flooded. They, their formation is flooded, but they, they don't flood currently uh, in the modern era. Uh, and our grey vertisols typically are the floodplain, are the current floodplain. But nonetheless, the whole Northwest Plains are the alluvial fan, and it's formed by flooding. So we've we've come to understand the value of those soils and, and what that means in terms of how much water you can store in those soils that you can then subsequently use for later production of whatever whatever the production system is. And just to give people or your listeners some sort of sense around that, quantitative sense around that, here we are at Walgut, average rainfall just under 500 millimetres a year, 474 millimetres a year on average. Somebody says, you know, we often joke about this too at Walgut, you know, what's our average rainfall? It's a drought plus a flood divided by two. <laughs> you know, that basically defines our average rainfall. So when I say to you we've got an average rainfall of 474 mils, it doesn't really mean much. We can have 1,000 millimetres and we can have 200 millimetres. A true average. <laughs> In 2019, our most recent um, real drought year, we, I don't think we cracked 100 millimetres at Walgut in the, in the calendar year of um, 2019. That's the most recent driest year on record. So the one prior to that was back in about 1901 or two. One of those years, I think we had 172 millimetres through the year. I don't think Walgut Rainfall Station has actually cracked 1,000 millimetres, but I think its wettest year on record is about 940 or 70 millimetres. So that just gives you an idea of the extremes. So somewhere in there is the, is the average. We can put away, in terms of a plant available water, or how big's the bucket, of about half that, of about 200 to 250 millimetres of water we can store in our soils. That is, is crop dependent. So different crops can root to different depths in the soil profile, and obviously the shallower ones don't have as big a bucket to access. But largely we can get close to 200 or perhaps a little bit more in terms of millimetres of plant available water. So that's a key plank to our production system. The second thing is we've learned to fill that bucket, ground cover is really critical. So ground cover and, and obviously fallow weed control. So fallows are such an important part of our cropping system or our dry land production system because the only way you can mitigate your risk is to fill your bucket up to get towards that 200 millimetres of plant available water. And the only way to do that is to fallow. Now, when you start the fallow, you don't know how long that fallow needs to be to get to the point to where the bucket's full. Could be three months, might be 33 months. We don't know the answer to that. What we have learned is that ground cover across that fallow period is critical. Probably the other key thing is by retaining ground cover, which fundamentally was cereal stubble, means that we had to find other crops to grow because cereals grown in cereal stubble, retain cereal stubble, don't work so well. You, your cereal stubbles that you're retaining as ground cover carry forward to the next crop all the issues of pathogens, you know, cereal-borne diseases, etc. And so we had to work, work our way around, well, we want to retain this ground cover, but we need to find another crop to grow in rotation. So, and that's been another transformation in this district. La when I first came here, it was largely just known for cereals, Pre predominantly wheat, a bit of barley and a, perhaps a little bit of oats for hay or whatever. Uh, in the modern dryland farming scene at Walgut, we don't really ever grow a cereal on a cereal anymore. Those days are gone um, and have been gone for 10 or 15 years, probably longer in, on, on the better farmers. Um, we grow rotations and we always have a rotation crop growing in the system to break that to break that um, carryover of um, cereal borne diseases or stubble borne diseases. So chickpeas, we learned how to grow chickpeas very early in the piece through the 90s. Uh, and I think we've learned to grow them very well out here. They, they love this environment. Uh, they're a crop that doesn't mind a dry season on the presumption that you've got sowing date right and a bucket of water for them to grow into. 
You've just driven in today past a sorghum crop, so we're not afraid to grow summer crop when the opportunity presents. Dryland cotton as a summer crop is another, I'll say a new kid on the block. We've been mucking around with dryland cotton for 25 years, but I think we're starting to get the rules around what makes a dryland crop successful. Faber bean, canola, you name it. There's not many crops here we don't grow, uh, but wheat, chickpea, other stables, yeah, without a doubt. So rotation-wise and, and crop type-wise, I guess we, we're clear on that. How is it evolving? And you mentioned cotton starting to come into the mix a little bit more, but what are some of those other opportunities on the, on the periphery that you guys are starting to see here as well? Yeah, so in the early days it was winter, winter system-based, so wheat, chickpea. Developing weed issues, so with, you know, one of the issues you run into with a zero-till system after 25 years of predominantly glyphosate roundup, roundup use uh, as your main tool in fallow weed control, you know, you fast forward 25 years, you've now got a lot more weeds that you don't kill very effectively with that particular um, herbicide active. And secondly, we've changed the weed ecology. So most of our weeds now typically are surface germinators. So we've got weeds like milk thistle, fleabane um, on the broadleaf front. We've got weeds like feathertop roads and ornless barnyard grass, all surface germinators. And so from an ecological point of view or, or a weed biology point of view, we're looking at, well, how do we manage those weeds more effectively given that the ability of our main strike tool, which was glyphosate, as a herbicide active, is becoming less effective. So, you know, herbicide resistance is real. Two ways to go there. You've, you can bury the seed, they're surface germinators, so one way is you bury them, simply tip them over with tillage, strategic tillage. So that's the tool that we're starting to utilise. The downside of strategic tillage is that you remove your ground cover that we know is so important. Uh, the other tool is better use of residual herbicides because residuals have a real activity of surface germinators uh, or surface germinating weed spectrums. So we've had to learn that. Uh, have we got that sorted? Not really, not yet. Uh, residual herbicides as an option is hard to make work effectively in a variable rainfall environment. So, you know, if you go forward, if you go east of here 200, 250 kilometres in a more, still a variable rainfall environment, but, but not as variable as Walgan, they can typically get residual herbicides to work with greater levels of efficacy. Whereas you bring that out to Walgan, so, some years the efficacy is as high as anywhere and the, the uh, subsequent weed control using that approach works really well. And other seasons we don't get the rainfall requirements and so we get very low efficacy out of residuals. So that's how we make that work in our system. I was going to ask, Greg, so... That, that balance between utilising, I guess, the chemistry to, to manage the weeds versus turning them on the head um, and tilling it. How are you guys, I guess, and yourself as an agronomist, how do you balance th those decisions and the trade-offs that come with one way or the other? And, and how's that changing? And I guess I ask that from yeah, a genuine point of interest about the, I guess, the spotlight that's coming on chemical use and, and from a consumer end. Um, and and actually, then how does that flow back into the, the practical reality of what's happening in the paddock? So on the tillage front, if we understand, again, that weed ecology, surface germinators, let's tip it over and bury the seed. And typically, we can run down the seed bank very effectively by doing that. But by doing that, we get rid of our ground cover. Mm. So there's a bit of a challenge there. So agronomically, it's a case of going, well, that's the science. What's the pra practical application of that? It's picking... Those points across your rotation, so crop sequence rotation, it might be over a, a three, five, seven year cycle where your ground cover is inherently low. So it might be the chickpea or the faba bean phase coming post harvest of those winter pulses, so chickpea, faba beans. Post harvest, we typically are at our low point in terms of ground cover. So it's picking those parts of the system and going, well, we don't have a lot of ground cover, so maybe this is an opportunity to tip that over and bury some seed. Yeah, right. So it's just working with the sequence and understanding that. Um, if you go to Western Australia and have a look at their take on burying weed but seed banks, 
you know, they're using moldboard ploughs, probably probably using moldboard ploughs for more than that particular reason. Um, we don't use a moldboard plough, but that's something that possibly needs to be investigated because a moldboard plough gives you that action of that uh, that inverting of surface to depth. We typically currently use a two-way plough, which still has a large bearing effect, probably a 70 or 80% um, bearing effect, uh, and, and that's obviously different to something like a, a chisel plough, which people might understand as a, as a sweep, you know, a time-based mechanism with a sweep on it, which probably retains 60 or 70% on the surface, so it doesn't achieve the inverting effect. So it's just understanding what tools growers have got or, or your yeah, landholders have got and working that out across the crop sequence. Every now and then you'll get a, a, a blowout in your weeds where we just, for whatever reason, we haven't been able to effectively control them. And so you'll just reset the system by simply going, well, I can't control that with herbicide. So I'm just, irrespective of where I am in the system in terms of ground cover, I'm just going to reset it. So I'm going to go and plough it and maybe plough it a couple of times, you know, over the course of a fallow summer or, or over a fallow, whatever the fallow length is, uh, just to purely reset the system. Yeah, cool. No, it makes sense. And I guess, yeah, just for the uned uneducated person like there, myself. There's a couple of other things in there that, you know, there's some other technology that's coming. So we've got optical sprayers now. Mm. So that's basically a, a, a technology that can sense a green weed and currently that's then applying a herbicide. But in the future, that may not be a herbicide. That might be laser, might be a microwave. It might be physical. It might be a tine. You know, there's a prototype running around here in the north developed by Sydney University, a team at Sydney Uni, where the sensor is sensing green and a tine mechanism is activated to dig that green out just for that little period. See, I've seen one, and I don't know whereabouts it is, but it's similar, optical, and then it's a flame. just goes <laughs> straight onto it. Yeah, so, so currently we're using herbicides because that's the tools we understand, but technology and the development of technology, I suspect in that space, will deliver non-herbicide control measures, which is pretty exciting. Yeah. So we've got optical sprays going. The other issue going on in the background here, and this is probably just a general issue, I reckon, right around the, the Australian um, cropping zone, is that we've, as you develop more com complex crop sequences or cropping systems, you've got to be more considerate for what your neighbour's growing. And so the good old days of, of you know, blanket applications of, uh, of non-selective herbicides in years gone past that doesn't work so well when you've got neighbours growing sensitive crops, be them dryland cotton or sorghum, as you've seen. You know, they're all susceptible to what else is going on around you. And so we've, as farmers and business operators, we've got to be far more considerate of that. So that's just another challenge that this whole farming system evolution has, um, has put on the table. It's was got to be managed. Yeah, there's, there's not a dull moment, I can assure you, <laughs> from an agronomy point of view. Yeah. And I think, well, that, I want to know, after 30 odd years of being an agronomist and being in this area, what is it that still keeps you passionate and excited about the future? <laughs> well, I joke about this actually with some of my colleagues further east, and I say further east or further south, but from my, perspe from my perspective, in more safer production areas, you know, either more rainfall, more reliable rainfall, whatever. But I have this joke, really, doesn't matter where you have your, where you live in Australia, you're variable. <laughs> you know, I heard a fellow on the radio only in the last couple of days. I think he was up on the north coast of New South Wales, just in behind Tweed there somewhere, um, in the Tweed Valley, saying that this year they'd measured 1,400 millimetres of rain, which sounds like a lot. But in 2022, they had something like 3,400 millimetres of rain. So even when you live at Walgett and you think of the Tweed Valley, for example, or anywhere else along the coast of Australia, you think of it. There's that wonderful green space that you go to typically on holiday and it's always green, always wonderful, and it must just be so safe and secure. And you realise that that's not the case at all. And I suppose one thing I've learned over my time in agriculture is that anywhere in Australia is variable. And we've all got this challenge of dealing with variable rainfall, irrespective of your postcode. Um, that whole idea dawned on me way back in about 2003, I think it was, I was down at Horsham speaking 
and Horsham is not dissimilar to Wild in a lot of ways. You've got the Wimmera north of Horsham that's a grey vertisol, cracking, clay soil. And I thought, before I went down, I thought I'd better understand a little bit about Horsham. So I pulled out some long-term average rainfall, or yeah, some long-term rainfall data of Horsham. And really, Horsham and Wild, if you put them side by side, really look very similar. It's just <laughs> that the the underlying trend is reversed. We have a trend that says our summers are slightly more wetter than our winters. If you take that to Horsham, their winters are slightly wetter than their summers. But typically, the variability is very similar. And so I've sort of been thinking about that and, and trying to understand what that means for our business for a long time. And I've just come to, as I say, I've, I've come to understand or come to recognise that anywhere in Australia you have to deal with a variable environment and, and the challenges that that then brings um, to the table. And, and so from a crop production point of view, it's knowing when to go and it's knowing when to go slow or sit on them, sit, sit on your hands and go, no, we don't have, we don't have the right points here to make, a, to make a planting decision, so we won't. We just simply won't. We'll just do nothing. I've got, I want to take a bit of a tangent here in a second, but following on from that, I'd love to know, Greg, from your perspective, why do you do what you do? Oh, well, yeah, sorry. That was probably the previous question. So I suppose I've always been challenged by the whole agronomy transition, bringing science to the paddock. That's really what I try and do. And the key part of that is not just understanding the science end of it. It's being able to communicate effectively with the, with the, the people operating the farming businesses out there, the landholders. I really enjoy that part of my role. I really enjoy the communication side of it, uh, probably equally as well as I, as I enjoy understanding the science part of it. So there's, that's, there's never a dull space in that. In that well, sorry, there's never a dull moment in that space because the science is forever changing and at the same time you've got to communicate effectively with large business operations that require a lot of capital to change. So you've got to convince them that this change is worthy of expenditure. And so that's that's a pretty important conversation to have, and it can be a challenging conversation to have. And we're having that conversation at the moment about this whole uh, this capacity to get over our country in a timely manner and what are the tools that need, you need to have on farm to do that. Because over the time we've come to recognise that when you pull you take the science and, and bring it to the paddock, things like sowing date of particular varieties, you know, we're down to that level. You, you pick a variety and the sowing date around that variety to optimise its, its yield outcome is as narrow as a week. You know, we just don't sow wheat in winter. We sow lancer wheat, long-reach lancer wheat, for example, in terms of a variety, in 10 days. We have a 10-day window. And if we miss that, we then go and find another variety. So we're very particular around our sowing windows to optimise our, our potential yield. Now, when we make that sowing decision, we don't really know what the yield is going to be, but we know some of the key drivers. We know how much soil water we've got. We know what our nutrition's like in the paddock. And now we've optimised our seeding date. So we've put ourselves in the top right-hand quadrant in terms of a yield outcome. Doesn't mean we'll land there. There's a whole heap of other variables that can influence that outcome, but we've put most of the big drivers, you know, we've, we've, we've got them behind us. And if we start breaking the rules around that, as in we, we plant a particular variety well outside its window, or we plant a particular variety on no soil water, or we plant a particular variety on no soil nutrition, well, you don't have all the, you know, we don't, we've, we've got a lot of things going against us before we even start. It, it really is quite a high performance unit. And I've spent a bit of time in the car over the last week. So what it makes me think about was years ago when British cycling was in a absolute pitfall, they started to look at what were those 1% marginal gains. So it was rubbing alcohol on the tyre for extra grip, optimising the amount of sleep people get. They painted the inside of their trucks white so um, they could see <laughs> little skerricks of dust that would potentially impact those. Like I've, thinking of what you've just said, like farming like down to those 10 day windows it, it really is a high performance unit in the paddock yep it is um and you know and it's you know we went back to that analogy earlier of you know mark measuring with a micrometer measuring with a pencil and cutting with an axe we'd like to get rid of the cutting with an axe <laughs> you know what i mean we've so in the early days of this agronomy change at a place like walgett 
and this has really happened across the whole wheat sheet belt around the country, but um, the, the gains were 10, 15, 20 percenters. But yeah, now we're a lot finer than that. So we're measuring with the micrometer, we're marking with a pencil still, but we we should be cutting with a, a saw. saw. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so we're trying to fine tune that, and they're the one, the one and two percenters we're now concentrating on. So that's that's I suppose what keeps me doing what I'm doing in this environment. And the other element to that that is worthy of mention is that Mother Nature ultimately still has the biggest say in all of this. We we can do all the things we do to try and minimise the impact Mother Nature has, but she ultimately has the final say with either she'll roll out a drier than average season or a wetter than average season. She'll lay on a flood across the floodplain when you least expect it. And you just got to deal with all that stuff and salvage what you can out of the, out of the, the just salvage what you can. But I think what still intrigues me and it's probably what still keeps my passion in this space is that even in years like 2023, so the current, well, sorry, we're now 2024, just, so the previous year, we managed to grow some pretty smart wheat crops based entirely on soil water. We didn't have really any effective in-crop rain, and yet we still had the odd grower around the district growing average to above average yield outcomes. We just didn't get the opportunity to do that over many acres, but the few acres we did that on was just that demonstration again as to why we do what we do and why it's so important to to make sure you are, you you execute the fine detail. Yeah. So beyond the agronomy work you do, and it'd be remiss of me not to mention that your son Tom's now working with you both on the agronomy side, but also the farming side. What's it like to have the next generation in the business and and working, I guess, with you on, on where the future's heading? Yeah. So if you just go back to an agronomy level, I've seen that generational change now on most of the farms I work on over the last, you know, however long. Um, I used to be the young kid on the block when I first started and all the growers I worked with were older than me. That's sort of a transformation. I'm now the old kid on the block and all the farms I work with now are younger than me. And then if I bring that to our own farming operation with my son Tom in the, you know, on the team, uh, yeah, that's that's been a tremendous, it's tremendous to be able to do that, to be honest with you. That's a tremendous thing to be able to work, uh, you know, work with um, sons, daughters, et cetera, and, and bring that next generation back into the system. Um, it's not without its challenges from the point of view that this next generation, like technology, they understand that they can operate those new technological platforms seamlessly. And so I think if I look forward over the next one to five and five to 10 years, there's going to be a real rollout of technology that perhaps the previous generation was sort of putting out at arm's length and going, hang on, I'm not really ready for that. Uh, This next generation is just going to take that and pick up the ball and run with it really hard. And a really good example of that is we've got some autonomous platforms running around now um, pulling optical weed sprayer technology. If, you know, that's the first, the first rollout of this. So, you know, an optical spray being pulled by an autonomous platform. It's the next generation that have taken that on. They're the ones operating that and they've just taken it on seamlessly. And yes, there might've been a little bit of hesitation and a few little hiccups like there is with any technology, but once we've got them operational, they're going, hang on a minute, this is a game changer. Because I always say to the, the, the grower group that I work with, we need less things to do on these farms, not more. <laughs> and so if we can take one whole activity off the list of things to do, because we've got an autonomous platform doing it out there, that has to be a great development, a great way forward. We're all time poor, um, like every farmer, all time poor. There's always a list of jobs to do that you never seem to get to the bottom of. Uh, and so having one of the most important jobs on the farm, which is keeping our fellows free from weeds, if we can take an element of that activity in our businesses and utilise an autonomous platform to help us achieve that, that's just, that's a game changer. Yeah, and I suspect over the next one to five years, you know, at the moment we've got three of those running around, we'll have 33 and then 133. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just going to be a game changer. And that rapid change of pace and the uptake is just going to get quicker and quicker. And, you know, and as we were then talking about earlier, it doesn't matter what the technology that that's pulling around in terms of achieving weed control is. It, it, it doesn't have to be herbicidal. 
I want to come back to something you mentioned at the very beginning. It was around your decision that you didn't necessarily think you were going to be involved in agriculture as you studied natural resource management. And I'd love to know, having spent your career now working in agriculture, where does agriculture sit in, in and around the realm of the word conservation? Well, you know, I, I, I think back to the degree I did, natural resource management, I think now back and reflect on 35 years at Walgett and really what, we've, what we're all about is natural resource management. That's exactly what we're about. It's about using a landscape in a productive way that's, you know, there might be plenty of people from the outside and go, oh, you're just a bunch of bloody farmers that are worth a heap of money, you know, you know, wealthy farmers and got lots of land and all those sorts of things. It's not quite like that, you know. When you're out here dealing with it, it's not quite like that. Yes, we've got good equity in what we do, uh, as a bunch of landholders generally, um, but you need that to be able to be resilient to manage the the vagaries of or the variability of the seasons that we have to encounter. So it's not, it hasn't been an easy point to get there, and and the future won't be easy just because, you know, we might have big numbers on a balance sheet. So to all those people out there that don't understand agriculture and don't understand um, the numbers that go behind agriculture. We need that sort of base, that financial base and the equity base behind us to manage and to be resilient into the future. And I look back and reflect on what we've done here over 30 odd years. And really it is as simple as, as good natural resource management in a productive way that's good for, good for the business that's doing the day to day activity. It's good for towns like Walgett, Narrabri, Moree, the ones that I'm involved in on the Northwest Plains. It's good for regional Australia, and it's good for Australia generally. And isn't that good for all of us? You know, there's an element out there that go, oh, yeah, but you're ruining the landscape. Well, yeah, I don't know about that. I disagree with that. Anyone who wants to come here and look at our landscape under a modern farming system, it's not, it's not what it used to be. You know, the, the, the erosion issues that were a feature of the past – we don't largely have those anymore because of ground cover and better systems. If I look at what Mother Nature provided pre-European involvement on the floodplains, it was a cycle of largely a grassland cycle, very open timber, you know, in terms of the landscape, if you read some of the early diaries and so on. You could counter that there was, you could probably claim that even across the Northwest Plains now, there's possibly more trees on the Northwest Plains now under a farming system, largely farming-based system, than there were pre-Europeans. Obviously, um, the Aboriginal management of the landscape prior to Europeans was, was involved a significant burning regime, uh, and that's what kept them largely grassland-based, not, not woodland-based. And you can see that. I can show you examples around here that as soon as you either stop the burning, stop that burning regime, uh, the landscape suddenly wanted to grow more, grow more um, uh, timber or, 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 or you know, move more towards a, an open woodland and then a, a, a more denser woodland. I don't know that, I reckon what we do here doesn't, you know, isn't that far removed from what Mother Nature was doing anyhow. I often look at our, our natural systems around here and here we are sitting down on this riverine environment that's obviously very diverse in terms of tree species, etc. But you've only got to go, as we talk, you've only got to go 500 metres away onto the floodplain, and all of a sudden that was a very, a much more simplistic system. Um, in a lot of cases, you completely lose the eucalypt species. You were back to one, one or two species of grass. You know, Mitchell grass was the predominant species. And Mitchell grass can often be largely a monoculture, not dissimilar to what we're now growing under a cropping system. So I, I don't know. I, I struggle with that a little bit. I think the key, the key from a landholder perspective across, if you look at our landscapes in a broader sense, is that the bits of our landscape that we don't utilise for, say, a, say a dryland farming use or or a more intensive agricultural outcome, we probably need to respect those more from a a biodiversity or a conservation outcome. Uh, and I think there's some programs in that space now that are trying to encourage that, and that's probably something that we should look at doing more of. But it, it's 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 probably you know I don't know what it is, what it is. Every every land holding is different because of where it is in the landscape. 
Um, some don't have a lot of diversity on their land holdings. Some other landholders have a significant amount of diversity across their landscape. And so it's just reflecting on those areas or respecting those different areas. Yeah. I don't know if that answered the question, but I... Yeah, I, no, it, I, it yeah. is. It's, it's, it's so interesting. And, and I think you being able to reflect on that, the, the knowledge you've got of the area and how it has evolved, but also evolved and, and transformed, but actually also potentially not actually that different either. Look, you know, I'm happy to acknowledge under a conventional farming system, yeah, it was chalk and cheese, but we don't really have a lot of that in the system anymore. Yeah, we have some, as we were talking about earlier, some strategic tillage. Mother Nature's pretty good at turning on strategic tillage in the middle of a drought out here. Yeah. It's not all beer and skittles and the Mitra grass doesn't just survive during droughts. When when Mother Nature turns on a good drought here, the wheels fall off our, our landscapes big time and they will be bare. They become bare, uh, dry, dry as in cracks four, five, six feet deep in the landscape. You can hardly walk across it. So that's Mother Nature's idea of tillage. Yeah. She's pretty good at it too, at the dry <laughs> end of the system, of the cycle. So you know, I, I actually think our dry land farming systems, and this is where I think my involvement and probably my, my training that came out of university gave me an ability to see, to see some of the natural resource management issues um, or key points. But I think we work pretty well with Mother Nature in our dry land farming systems. Yeah, I really believe that, and I think we do a pretty good job on it. So I've got a couple of questions to wrap on, and they're they're quick fire. So th really, the first things that come to your mind on this, um, and they're meant to be fun. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. what's your favourite grain based dish? Probably pasta. Okay, who'd be three people, past or present, you'd invite around for pasta? Hmm, an interesting one. <laughs> um, this is where the edit comes in. <laughs> yeah, past or present. I think the next generation is really interests me. I don't necessarily understand it that well, but I look at my son Tom, and and you know he's got a couple of couple of siblings. Um, but I look at my son Tom; he's got a very inquiring mind because of the way he's been trained, his formal qualifications in ag science and some experience. He's got a very inquiring mind as to why you do that or how you do that or how we could do that better. Uh, and he's a pretty good conversationalist, so. You'd sit him at one end of the table, I reckon, or someone at least of similar, so the next generation, but he's a pretty good example of that. You know, I, I've known a lot of people over the years in agriculture that I probably didn't spend enough time with and they're no longer with us, but um, I'd have to think about who the person out of that group that might be worthy of sitting at the end of the table. But there's definitely a few in that in that, um, in that that space. Uh I like this. We're going tops of people. So we've got younger, we've got someone from, someone, from the past, the wisdom. Yeah. And the other person, and this will intrigue a lot of people when I say this, but I'd probably put Paul Keating at the end of the table. And the reason I say that is, I don't necessarily agree with Paul Keating's politics all the time, but he was a very formative person in my development or in my un development of my understanding of the world beyond agriculture, just the whole economic platform and and how Australia sits into the world scene. He was a very formative figure. Now, Paul's still with us, so we can sit him at the end of the table. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I still think back, you know, we made comment earlier in this about the recession we had to have. Well, I don't know anymore whether we had to have that recession and it, it probably did a lot of damage to things. But I think at the end, the end result of that recession was we were all a whole lot stronger and a whole lot wiser in the way we run our businesses into the future. Um, so there was some good that came out of that pinch point. That's your three. Probably that's, a, that's, that's three. I yeah. haven't found a name for that person in the ag space that perhaps is no longer with us, but there's plenty in that space. Yeah, I'd have to think a bit more. You know, Jim Prattley, I think Jim's still with us, but Jim was pretty formative for me. I think he's still running around I think Charles State Uni. Yeah, he is. I think my son had some involvement with Jim. Jim was a very interesting fellow when I was at Charles State University doing that external graduate diploma in ag science. Yep. What's something you've got on your bucket list, Greg? Oh, look, I, I want to find a bit more time to travel. I don't know that I necessarily, and by travel, I don't mean necessarily international travel. I've done a little bit of that. I'd probably like to do a bit more. I'd just like to tie, and I'll probably plan to do this in the coming few years, just find a bit more time to understand 
there's a lot of Australia out there. Like, you know, I've traveled a fair bit of Australia, but I'm a fly in, fly out type traveler. Yeah. I'd probably like to spend a bit more time in some of those places. Go there and spend a fortnight or a month, not just three to five days. Yeah. Something like that. And there's, doesn't really matter where that is in Australia, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm an avid trout fisherman. Uh, I like to get up into the high country and do a bit of trout fishing. I always like to find a bit more time for that. I still try and ride a motorbike at times, <laughs> you know, just an, an enduro bike, not so much at enduro pace anymore, but just it allows you to get to places that you can't, you can't access otherwise. It's a great place. I, lo I love the Australian bush, I've got to say, and it doesn't matter whether you're out here on the Western Plains or up in the high country or perhaps in the tropics somewhere. I love Australia. Uh, and that probably comes back from that natural resource management training. I love just spending time in the environment and trying to understand it better. Something I'd like to try and do a bit more of. You know, we talk about fly and fly out. The last time I was in and around Wilga, it was 16 years ago. I'm only 31, so that's over half my life ago. <laughs> yep. That's insane. Yep. Yep. What's, I'll, I'll say, what's a question you've got for a future guest, but maybe what's something that you're curious about at the moment that maybe I could ask someone? I suppose. The scientist in me, you know, the, 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 you know, we got some real issues coming in our farming systems around weed control. And so the science component of me says, well, how are we going to deal with this going forward? You know, we've got at a world level and certainly at a, at a higher society level, this requirement that we produce clean, green produce, healthy produce. I think we do that pretty well. Um, but ultimately these questions around, you know, pesticide use in the system. So where are we going with that? You know, what's, what's that future going to look like? You know, I've seen the benefit of pesticides and I just put that as a general group, herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, whatever. Um, but just pesticides generally, I've seen the, what they've been able to deliver in a production sense. And I understand that quite well. But then on the other side of that, you've got this end user looking for clean and green, and you have to respect that. Um, sometimes I think that they're calling for that without really understanding the systems, the production systems that go behind it. And so maybe it's just a case of getting them at the table and sitting around and having a chat uh, around why we do what we do and, and how those products play out in that whole food production chain. I remember I was down on the York Peninsula, I believe. No, Clare Valley, I think it was, in South Australia a few years ago, 2019. And I can't remember the girl now that got up and spoke to us. But she was talking about this disconnect between, you know, people, as we say, behind, you know, that live east of the Sandstone Curtain, um, you know, Sydney, Melbourne and and, you know, almost the rest of Australia. 95%. 95% of Australia. Mm. How do we, you know, in this disconnect between what we're doing out here and, and believing that we're doing it really well for their benefit and, 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 and feeding the people of the world's benefit, really, um, it's not just our benefit. Uh, we're doing it f as, as food producers, by and large. Um, how we bring them back to the table, and, and she was she was saying that, We've lost that one-to-one -one connection, so not everyone out here has an aunt or a sister living in Sydney or Melbourne anymore. That There's a much bigger disconnect than that going on. And she made the comment that we really have to take matters into our own hand on that and make sure that when we get an opportunity to talk to those people, we put, we put the topic on the table and have a discussion around it. Mm. We need to make sure that we all, and I, I say that all, all of regional Australia collectively, doesn't matter whether you live in Moree or Dubbo or Wagga, when we're talking to our city cousins or city friends or whatever connections, we need to be more proactive in the discussions we have around how regional Australia operates. Uh, and you can't deny that regional Australia largely is, is agricultural based. There's many other industries, obviously, but agriculture is a key part of them. One final question, Greg. We've talked, uh, I think, a lot about where agriculture is today and that evolution and just how much it's transformed over your career. If you were walking out of the university gates today and into a career and you could do anything in agriculture, if every job paid the exact same, what would you pursue? 
Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I don't know that I do anything much different, and yet I ended up where I am now by, you know, not by choice necessarily. It was just a case of I came to Walgett and I just, when you get to a T intersection, you've got to choose. Do I go left or right? Well, you you live by those decisions, and here we are 35 years down the track, still living at Walgett. We still love the place. Walgett's been a tremendous town, tremendous community, not without its issues, but all all communities have issues. Um, I think I could say to you that I'd probably take exactly the same approach to the workplace, as in I don't know where it'd end up. I'd just wait till I got to the T and the sections and make the decisions as you see fit at the time. Um, but what I would do and what I acknowledge now with the benefit of hindsight is I really like communicating and talking to people. That's a key part of my role in the grains industry generally and just just generally, you know, particularly locally. And people, I think, would acknowledge that. I, I love chatting to people. I'm not afraid to talk to anyone about anything really, uh, particularly in the ag space. But um, and and I say to the to the agronomists I've trained up over the years and and have have had involvement with communication. You know, in an agronomy space, is at least fifty percent of the role. And I suspect that it's that you that that same sort of rule book applies to most jobs out there. Most it's your ability co- to communicate and and sell, or not sell, but get the message across in a way that is respectful of whatever you're trying to sell, I suppose, mm. and respects what, yeah, yeah, it's respectful to the issue you're trying to solve. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, you, you could look at that the other way and go, well, you know, I look at this disconnect and we've got this, this um, community, particularly on the east coast of Australia, that wants, you know, a lot more, greener outcomes, we'll just call them greener outcomes, more environmentally sound outcomes, I think a lot of good had come, would come from that sector of society if they simply started coming out to some of these areas and having that chat sitting around a table. Yeah, you know, bringing that together. I mean, we're not against that necessarily, but we need to understand it before we can actually do anything about it. We don't like being just told what to do from afar. Well, Greg, I reckon we'll, we'll park that one, but, um, thanks so much for the opportunity to sit down with you down here in this beautiful part, which is your home. And, um, thank you for joining us on GRDC and conversations. It's been fantastic to chat with you. No, well, look, thank you for coming along. And as you say, wonderful spot, uh, great chat and see where it ends up. Thank you. Thank you.